for the introduction. I need a mic because I need to record the song. So, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, it's my great honor to be here, and we also visit, you know, Duration and also the colleagues, you know, because we recently was awarded a collaborative um, grant from SF called the Eastbound AI, which will promote the collaboration between UT San Antonio and also the Duke or in general the Athena for the AI and the neuromorphic computing research. Um, I also want to give a talk about what we're doing, um, which we call the unleashing the potential of edge computing with the innovations in the air hardware and also software. Just give the people a little bit of background about um, back to three years ago when we want to promote this uh, AI Institute. And so we start with our thinking about how we're going to partition to edge computing. So people are made familiar with how we're going to do this, right? You have a cloud computing, which will give you some computing resources we can leverage. And you also have the edge devices as a you know, pretty much you know the wearable device electronic which you can carry every day and also the networks in between to connect all those information so but the issue is if you really partition the edge computing system like this you actually going to create the difficulty to cross layer optimize you know the whole system and also you know you partition the computation and the communication individually, which means that you'll need to somehow optimize them individually and then think about how you can synchronize them. That's basically, it's not what we want. Um, we can actually also look at the whole edge computing system from a global view, which means we just consider we have a lot of compute nodes and they are connected. We're gonna perform the local computing. We're gonna perform the collaborative computing. We're gonna connect the data and the compute together and also protect you know, the data transfer between different components for privacy and security. So this actually, mm, let me see the page up, page down, okay. Okay, so, this actually allow us you know, to provide a holistic perspective about edge computing, which will give you a unified and a compute-centric view. It's going to enable both vertical, which means across the layer, and also horizontal cross node optimization for this edge computing system. And AI apparently is going to provide a foundation for defining and executing this uh, astrologies. So this actually become our, our goal that we want to build up our highly scalable, efficient and robust, of course, secure edge computing system powered by the AI. So follow this uh, uh, motivation, we propose this uh, Athena AI Institute. We're collaborating with you know the eight uh, universities, including the uh, Duke Institute, by the way, including uh, Mi Wisconsin, Michigan, MIT, Yale, Wis uh, Princeton, and also NCNT to build up the whole infrastructure. And that by working together with a few industrial partners like Microsoft, Motorola, Sony, and also smaller vendors. So, and also some educational partners like uh, you know some. Stan Gurley College or some other other in the high schools or middle school. Um, as Duration mentioned recently, we uh, were awarded to get together for this um, uh, expand AI. So it's like allow us to expand our footprint to the Texas. Okay, so if you look at the challenges, you know, which we need to deal with, the first and uh, maybe the biggest challenge is the scaling up of the AI models running on the edge devices. So this is shown, you know, the publication dates of this, uh, you know, AI models we usually use and also the performance. When we are improving the, the performance, you know, so on the first, uh, you know, we actually increase the parameter number as I show here exponentially. There's a growing size, you know, make the design space optimization very difficult and we have to somehow compress you know this model to make sure it can fit in into the you know uh, the edge devices 
And also the code design become very important, which means we need to somehow design both the software, especially models and also hardware simultaneously to make sure we can deliver very high efficiency without sacrificing the performance that much. So in general, you know, this can generate the increasing demands for the computing storage as well as the communication bandwidth because we need to transfer more data between the cloud and the uh, edge devices and also between the different edge devices. Another challenge is about the personalization. Why I want to come up uh, talk about this because for each edge devices, even the many cases they may share with the same model. So we're actually going to train the model in a different way because the different devices may are facing different subset of the data. Even the data may still to show some correlation between them. So one example is in the federal learning for the large language model models or such an you know, NRP application. So many user specific features such as domain specific instructions, emotional tones, culture factors, so on the first, going to make the personalization a must, but at the same time complicated the challenges here. Uh, it also, you know, require a unique instantiation of the deployed model on each edge device, which will allow us or even force us, you know, to personalize the model running on the different devices. Third one is the privacy and the security, uh, which will not be discussed in this um, talk because of so many things to cover. But in general, you can imagine the one motivation of uh, running this model on the edge because the privacy. You don't want to share your personal data or sensitive information. You want to keep everything running on the local. And even you need to share those models for certain reason. You don't want to share all the features. You only want to share the necessary feature which you are willing to share. And also the multi-device, you know, edge computing scenario. In many cases, millions of devices are connected in one network. They actually going to enable very easy malicious attack, you know, as we are going to going to have. This will bring another dimension of the challenge, which is going to ensure the security of an edge computing system. So let's talk about the first thing today, which is you know, how we can design an intelligent edge device and also the models, you know, so that we can really running on those devices, especially on the neural architecture search. Uh, it's not new, right? Because all neural, neural architecture search is basically a subfield of auto ML, which allow people to automatically design the deficial, efficient neural network by um, observing the requirements at hardware level. And the idea is very simple because traditionally when people are designing the neural network, you have to know two things. The first thing is about the neural network design. The second thing is about the domain knowledge. And you leverage your domain knowledge you know, to design the neural network, which can to deliver the performance you want you know, for the data you want to process. It can be very time consuming and that can be very costly, not the computational wise, but also the human resource wise, because you need the people to know both. And those guys are very expensive. People thought about this saying, look, if we have all the training data and we know what is our goal, maybe we can automate the whole process you know, by you know, selectively combining the component of the neural network you know, to deliver the performance. So we can create a library here, and then we can you know, randomly select the operators of from those library, build up the network, and try out the performance and to see how much we can achieve. If the performance is lower than what we want, we can continue to improve the performance by adding more component. But that can cost a very high search cost in the past because you, know, you need some optimization process to do the work. And the hardware design space could be very large, even that need to be integrated into this uh, you know, search process. So when we look at this, so we want to develop some methodology which give us a very low cost automated design process as we can do you know, for the embedded, embedded system design. So the first thing we need to do is that we need to somehow extract you know, the topologies of the neural network, you know, to the one we can do the search. 
we can use the directed, you know, I circulate the graph, DAG, as a prototype to construct a third space. And what we need to do is want to find out the graph which can represent the neural network. It's not quite, you know, the difficult, right? Because we can have this graph, I can have each you know, component that either going to be the connectivity or going to be the operators to represent the different data flow and also the operations. For example, we can have this convolutional layers or they can have a combination and operation or even the activation function as this operators that we can construct the graph, we can search. So question becomes how we will generate the candidates, you know, which we want to explore and to evaluate. So we need to partition the neural network to a different cell because we want to constrain, you know, the space which we need to explore. We can we have those cells. So each cell it will be the layers or some component of the neural network, and we will randomly select the combination of the different connectivities to create the candidates we want to evaluate. And we can have a trial evaluation based on the proxy data set, which means a subset of the training da data, and to find out, you know, the search metrics, which will give us some guidance about which candidate we want to preserve, which candidate we want to continue involve. And then we'll find out the best candidate self log sub topology, and we somehow cascaded this up together. Um, then after we solve this representation problem and also the candidate generation problem and also the pre-evaluation problem, the next question is how we can develop the optimization process. You can do many ways to do it. You can really consider this one as a district optimization process, which means you can exhaustively search you know, different combinations that we have done in many other graph you know, optimization. Or you can even do more you know, an intelligent way, which means you may want to leverage what we are familiar with, like optimization we do in the neural network training. So in the neural network training, if you still remember, we build up some goal, which will be the loss function or something. And then we train the neural network and to gradually, you know, to lower, lower the loss function to the saturated level. If we can somehow to create such a, you know, the target function, and we can leverage the same optimization process as we have done in the training of the neural network and to really optimize the nuts. The question becomes so how we are able to convert the district you know, search space to the continuous space, search space so where you can use the differential optimization as we are using in the training of the neural network. What we could do is we, we can create the multi-dimensional space, which can be used to represent the topology of the neural network. Because we have a finite number of the basically the operators in the neural network. And we can find out some encoding scheme to encode the whole topology to the one vector in this optimization space. And the similarity between different topologies will be considered at the relative angles between the different vectors. And by doing so, we're actually going to convert our optimization process you know, from the district space to the continuous space. And then we are able to optimize, you know, the topologies, you know, as we are doing in the optimization process in the neural network training. So this will be the whole differential approach we developed a couple of year, years ago, which is very different from the one for all or one shot, you know, the, the, the neural architecture search. So we have the encoder to encode all this, uh, you know, the topology of the neural network you know, to some vectors. And we will consider the graph kernel and also to generate the right relative angles or relative similarities. And we use that one, you know, to train the neural network to find out, you know, the best candidates. Uh, over the iterations, you can gradually improve the performance that we show here. The whole process will purely computed in the continuous you know, optimization space and can be very fast. In this case, for example, uh, our solution, which is considered as, uh, uh, which will be considered as here, 
is actually give us, you know, the GPU that is only a couple hours. So we're able to find out, you know, the very good, you know, compressed neural network with the relatively the same performance with the similar computational cost. So why I want to do this? Because this is going to avoid, you know, our designer to spend, you know, hundreds or even thousands of GPU hours to design their neural network rather than just a few hours. Can quickly deploy the neural network to the particular embedded system, you know, for this design. And more important, we can actually embed many other constraints in the whole optimization process because the only thing we need to change will be the target function, such as the power consumption, the memory usage, or, you know, just any other hardware de design parameters. This is one example, you know, we actually many years ago, we participated in the challenge, you know, um, organized by Core Core Qualcomm, trying to um, develop the visual recognition for segment, you know, segmentation and the human post, you know, estimation using the NAS to search for particular neural network running on the one particular hour, with you know the fixed amount of memory on the trip, so. And because we need to handle the different objects on one image with the different sizes. So traditionally you have multiple branches in the neural network to handle different sizes. You have to have to have some connectivities between different branches to make sure you can share some information for maximizing the accuracy. And, but we don't know which connect, connection will I'll play the role, so we actually can keep all the kind of negativities. It'll be very, you know, costly and not gonna be, you know, the memory friendly. But using the NAS where we're designing, we can easily find out, you know, or preserve, you know, the, all the necessary uh, kind of negativities between different uh, branches to minimize the memory usage and to maximize performance. And we rank number one among all these teams, and later on we wrote a paper about it. And that was ranked in the highest in the Auto ML conference on 2022, the highest, highest review score. Um, we actually can do much larger size in your network. You know, we have been working with the Manta on applying this technique to the recommender stage system so that we have a much larger recommender system which can guide you for the web browsing or some other stuff. And you need to handle much more complex, you know, the operators, you know, like you know the dense kind of negativities, the interaction types, or the interaction sizes between the d different information we need to handle in the recommender system. And you'll need to handle also much larger search space. So you need to deal with, you know, uh, this uh, larger space with some tricks such as a single operator any connection sampling, which will give you some optimal sampling between different branches of this neural network. And also the operator balancing technique, which actually can balance the usage of the different operators and make sure we will have the minimal usage for the memory and the computational resources. So this paper was published this year, you know, 3W, and has been used actually in the real product of the Manta because the you know, technical lead was my students. Okay, so, but if we look at all this, it's actually against what, we are designing the neural network, right? Because when a real human designs the neural network, never start with this. What we can do is we start with the smallest neural network and try. If the smallest neural network cannot really give us a good performance, we increase the size and try again. We keep doing this. Nobody gonna start with a large neural network trying to shrink them, right? So, okay. Um, we tried something in 2020, which we call the auto ML. That paper was published, by the way, in KKDD 2020, also revealed very high. We say, oh, okay, let's try to mimic the behavior of the human to design the neural network. We start with a very minimal size of the neural network and you know, with the different cells. If we cannot reach the performance, let's increase the size a little bit, just try again. You need to somehow design the growing policy, make sure you can mimic the behaviors but on also initialization, so on the first. Um, but let's see the result. If we're doing this, you know, what we can really receive. So the result is very interesting. There is a trade-off between the computational cost 
and also the performance. You understand this. And there is a frontier trade-off curve so that you can achieve you know, some performance with some competition costs and so on the first. We can always you know, reach one point in this frontier, but we cannot really control which point we're going to converge. Okay, because you know the whole search space or the growing paths are so hard to be controlled, so we end up you know open opening up more questions rather than the constructive conclusion we can make from this paper. I don't think the paper really complete. The paper basically generated more questions, but still the paper was accepted, but. That's interesting thing to look at, you know, how, what is the difference between the human designing the neural network and the machine designing the neural network? Okay. Uh, you have a neural network, but you can't even do more than that. So what I talk about, you know, how we can design the hardware support on this at both the algorithm level and also the hardware level. I know you probably know the neural network can be very redundant, which means if you look at the weights of the neural network, there are many weights are close to zero or even zero. They're there, okay? It's just a topological existence, but that doesn't really contribute any, anything or not much because all the input times zero will be zero out. So many years ago, people look at this saying we can do the pruning. By the way, pruning is not, it's not a new topic, okay? So pruning has been done, the complex sensing and all kind of stuff. We do the pruning so we can really remove the competition relevant to this uh, zero weights safely. And we can still achieve the group performance by saving the competition on cost. The most famous one was, uh, you know, the, the pruning maybe published by the Song Han, you know, from MIT many years ago, talk about this. And also some other people at this almost the same time. But if you look at their papers, they all talk about something we call um, theoretical acceleration or uh, speed up. They never give you the real measurement on the real computing system. The reason is if you really use the prone neural network running on the GPU, you will find out in many layers that you're going to significantly slowing down the performance of the GPU rather than accelerate them. Why? Because our modern GPU or CPUs are running based on one important principle, which is the data locality. If you are using one data here, you're pretty much sure you're gonna use all the data around this data or adjacent data, right? So you do the prefetch, you do a lot of tricks you know, to make sure you can predict this behavior and they can avoid you know, fetching the data from lower level of the memory hierarchy. If you randomly remove the weights of the neural network based on their amplitude, what's going to happen? You create a lot of holes when you are fetching data from the memory. You have this one, yes. You are fetching a stand next one, but they're not there. It's actually going to go through the whole memory hierarchy, go to somewhere late, later on and then bring them back. So we look at this problem, we say, look, so simply solution should not be generating a hardware to predict such a behavior and then reload those things on first. The simple solution should be what? We just prune the neural network, which is going to preserve such a data locality, which means we are either going to prune the whole column or the whole row or the whole block or in the memory, rather than we prune them randomly purely based on the amplitude of the weights. Now the question becomes how we can do it without sacrificing the performance. If we know that it will be the principle, we came up with something called the group, uh, called the structural pruning in 2026, sorry, 2016 new, new reps. So we say, look, we look at you know the data arrangement in the memory. We found out you know the data corresponding to the whole channel, whole filter, whole layers, you know, so on the first, or even the different simple position with the different few kernels, that's actually corresponding to the whole and the whole column in the memory. We go and load them as a, a block. So we just group you know, all this uh, with as one group. And when we prune the neural network, prune the neural network group by group rather than weight by weight. 
So we can preserve, you know, the data locality that I'm show here, and we can improve the performance. It's a very simple trick. We just, you just need to change the one line in your neural network training process, and you significantly improve the performance. And now this structural pruning technique has been the standard, standardized the process so when you processing the neural network has been applied everywhere. And this paper has been cited for more than 2,500 times. So, and also work with the Intel, you know, to de de deliver, deliver their first generation NLP, you know, microprocessor, you know, similar technology for the uh, LSTM and also the RN rather than just the UCM. You also heard about the quantization, right? Quantization is so very simple because when doing the training, you have to have a floating point. You have to preserve the high precision because you need to calculate the gradients. You understand this. And when you do the inference, you don't need to because for the inference, you can have very low precision running and you still be able to have very high accuracy. So people talk about the A integer, A big integers, four big integer, even binary neural network. Um, but do you still remember, you know, how to do the quantization? Many years ago, people tell you, if you have the floating point, like 0 0.6, you don't quantize that one. 0 0.4 will be zero, right? You can chop to a different basket or something, blah, blah, blah. But what is the relation between the pruning and the quantization? We try to figure out this. So in 2021, we published one paper saying, if we do the pruning, if we look at the quantization, for example, six and six and three, we basically means that we're not going to use the MSB for those two bits. We say, hey, we now we can represent the three, the number in the three bit rather than four bits. Ten and four, we can chop the last bit the you know, RSB, so we can also have you know the three bit with you know the two times all those stuff. But if we look at the whole thing, it's very similar. Like what we are grouping the whole column here saying we basically want to prune the whole column in our quantization process. So we basically can apply the same structural pruning on the quantization during the training to the same same thing. That is the intrinsic tradition, intrinsic relation between the pruning and the quantization. So we actually come up with a paper called the BSQ. It's called the bit level sparsity stuff. It's allow us to apply the group of pruning for every single column so that we can prune the neural network by using, we, we can quantize the neural network by using the pruning technique we developed many years ago. And we achieve the highest pruning, uh, sorry, quantized rates, you know, in terms of the number of the bit with the highest accuracy. Okay. So we can do even more than that. Many years ago, we do something called uh, uh, if you look at the kernel, for example, kernel is basically a vector represented with a multi-dimensional space. We actually can do the uh, do the decomposition, so I can represent one kernel with you know the combination of the coefficient between the basis vector to re restore the kernels. Okay, that's another way we can do uh, the, the compression of, of the neural network, but we have a tool to do it. You know, when we have the input, we can actually times this coefficient and then times by the basis. Or we can have input times by the basis and times by the coefficient. So in this Howard design, we're actually gonna re arc this convolution so that we can have, a, a, we can reshuffle the computation to have, have the input and then times by the coefficient and then times by the, di the different basis so that we actually can perform the convolution at the last stage so that we don't need to wait until everything to be computed. We don't need to generate a lot of intermediate results on the first. And that is a one hour support you know, for those, to have those uh, algorithm level optimization. We call it the uh, e e uh, uh, I I escalated. So this actually gonna, gonna achieve you know the two times the latency reduction with three times the energy efficiency. And because you know the input feature map and also the kernels are also sparse, right? So we actually can develop some hardware to just match the non-zero input and, and uh, also the coefficient to you know, compute them. So we don't need to compute anything where there is a one operand is zero. 
uh, if you look at the, the pruning, we're going to prune the layer by la layers. And if we prune the whole things out, then you're not going to compute the, you know, the following computation because all the inputs you know, will be gone. But in some cases, you know, if you re regenerate something out, you have to bring you know, some intermediaries on the back so that you, can re you need to compute them again. So basically what I'm saying is the pruning per layer will impact the data reuse in the GPU utilization, right? And this will basically allow you, or basically you need to store some intermediate results, you know, back and reload them back to back again, again, you know, if we find now later on, you need to reuse it. But you actually, that'd be the static optimization because you already know which component you're going to prune. You already know that going to generate some component which later on you will be reused or not. If you already know this, you can have to prune the neural network intentionally that you won't generate anything that will be re that will be used once and will be idle for many long long time and reuse them again. You basically say if I I'm gonna use this one, I repeatedly use this component until the everything will fade out. I don't I don't use this one anymore. If I need to, I just discard this. I may sacrifice the the accuracy a little bit but I will significantly improve the performance because I don't need to reload everything back and again and again. So this is called the cascading structural pruning. So when you're gonna perform the structural pruning, we will have another uh, component, the loss function, you know, to make sure, you know, we won't generate any, you know, redundant data reuse in the later GPU design we show here. So which means if we completely remove this component, then we'll make sure later on, we're not gonna call them back. So that's actually going to find out that if we sacrifice the accuracy by less than one person, we're actually going to make the whole thing the five times more efficient. Because simply because the GPU is so sensitive to the data reuse, okay, so that we don't need to do. The paper was published in ESCA 2022 last year. Okay, we give many, many examples. So sorry, just one slide per idea because I'm trying to give you some basic idea, but you are certainly welcome to read the paper for more details. Now let's move our, you know, the focus a little bit higher. Let's look at, you know, the um, distributed learning or federated le learning. You may be familiar with the federated learning, which allow all the devices are connected together. The, the assumption here is that for the different edge computing devices, they are facing different subset of the data, okay? And the data is actually called a non-IID, also later on, which means that they're somehow correlated, but not exactly the same. So if you're training the neural network, which can really handle such data, you want to maximize the exposure to all the data. So what you can do is you actually going to consider you know, the contribution from all this data, you can compute the gradients, you know, on the model and send the gradients, you know, to the centralized server, do the averaging and send them, and send the average the gradients back to the different models. And you can do the personalization or something first. So this mechanism gives you the advantage, you know, of maximizing the usage, the use of all the data, you know, belonging to the different devices but they also create a lot of data traffic between the edge device and also the central uh, server. So, but no matter what, you know, this has been very popular methodology which have been used in the you know, finance in some other uh, D, D, you know. But if you look at the total communication cost, we need to transfer a very high precision data, in many cases, the gradients, right? with you know, the larger number of the parameter because the neural network itself can be very large and also the number of the communication round. So if I add everything together, for example, for the image night with a VGG stick team, you will end up with you know, 500 terabytes to train only one model. It's not that large. So even worse, you know, the data is what we call a non-ID or non-identically distributed, which means the data, they are similar, but not exactly the same. So you cannot really treat them, you know, um, I will say independently. So 
that will create more challenges, you know, to be to consider such a heterogeneity. So if you don't consider this, you may have very high accuracy, but if you really consider it as a correlation, you know, the accuracy of the traditional federal learning will be very, very low. That's another reason you need to really do the personalization on each of different devices because you need to handle such, a, you know, the dissimilarity of the data. Uh, the pre R, you know, have been done, have been done my, many stuff, such as in the communication cost. For example, you can compress the data, do something, some blah, blah, quantization. You also can handle the statistical heterogeneities, you know, by using different methodology, like, you know, the mitigate the diverse between local model, global model, or you can, you know, the, do the personalization, or you can have a, you know, such and such. So, we propose one technology uh, called the lottery FL. So basic idea is based on a concept called the lottery ticket network. Lottery ticket network is an interesting idea. Let's say we have uh, some super night I don't show here. So which is original network, you know, identical to all the edge devices. But the personalization of the neural network on each device will be performed by selectively using only the portion of this network, you know, corresponding to you know, the unique feature on the different devices. In this case, only the red dot, the yellow dot, or the blue dot. So in, on each location, they may share the same value among all this neural network, but they're identical However, they just use a deep, different topology or different subset, you know, to realize the personalization. We call the lottery ticket network. That by doing this, you know, we can certainly uh, uh, satisfy the personalization with a non-ID setup, and we make the communication relatively efficient because we don't really transfer every single waste or every, every, every single gradient is corresponding to these parameters in this neural network. Only, only need, to, need to transfer basically the updated you know, parameter corresponding to a different device. Now how we are able to do the averaging between different gradients, it's gonna be very sim simple because when we send out everything up, we're only going to update or do the averaging on the overlapping parameters, you know, between the different nodes, and we don't do any others. And after, you know, the averaging, we'll send the average of the gradient back to the each um, copies of these uh, models and and re re rerun it. And you can do even more aggressively. You can just uh, prune the neural network so that you can retrain the subset of the network blah blah. So. We we'll give some results to show here. We have uh, you know 10 to 40 samples per each uh, devices. We well, have only two classes you know of the examples on each device, and data could be very unbalanced, which means if for amount of the two classes, the um, number of the data belonging to one class is actually much larger than another one. We have some baseline to compare, especially we're going to evaluate you know the inference accuracy and also communication cost. The result basically show that you know, for the CFR 10, you know, our lottery tickets, you know, the federated learning will have the six, sorry, the 13 to 15% accuracy improvement compared with, you know, the, uh, the average, uh, the Fed average. And they're gonna reduce the communication cost by 30 to 50% because the model can convert much faster than before. And this, this actually can be the balanced data. If you have unbalanced data, which means, you know, the, in this case, you know, 0 0.25 means the number of the one class data is actually five times larger than another one. So you start to see we're actually gonna improve the accuracy even more with, you know, the, you know, the, the small smaller number of the, uh, the communication cost. So this technology solves two problems. One is the communication, um, one is the communication, another one is the computation potentially, because we only need to upgrade, uh, up, update, you know, the part of this network. But it does not really solve another problem, which is the memory usage, because we need to keep, you know, the supernet or the original network, you know, on every single.
can go device and also transfer them, you know, between the uh, device and also the centralized server. Can we do even more aggressively? Can we just uh, find out another way so that we don't need to have such a super night rather than we have many other ways to fine tune the network or called the personalized network. So we came up with something we call the fat mask. The fat mask do more aggressively like this. So you basically have the original network but we don't have the subset of the network. Instead, we create a mask on the network. The mask just has zero and one on each component. So what we really do is we have original network and we apply the mask. Whenever the mask allows the waste to go through, we will let the waste to go, go to the centralized server. Otherwise we'll block this waste. And the personalization will be uh, will be realized by only training the topology of this mask on each different devices. So people some some sometimes question about are we really be able to do this because it looks like we don't really train the neural network. What we really do is actually just to find out the combination of the mask, right? But the, 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 the reality is if the mask is larger enough, you know, we actually can really find out, you know, the good combination between the between the pre-trained, you know, the network and also the mask to perform the accuracy and the personalization simultaneously. Okay, so here is, uh, you know, how we're gonna perform the things. So we basically learn the heterogeneous and the structure of sparse uh, binary mask. Uh, we're only gonna communicate, you know, the binary mask between the device and also the server. We don't really communicate, communicate you know, the original network, done. So basically we only transfer zero and one between the device and also the centralized server. And the binary mask will be the element-wise applied to the frozen parameters to generate the personalized and structural sparse network model. So we need to do the aggregation. We call the averaging, you know, on the gradients. In this case, we do the mask. So what we can do is very simple. We only only send a zero and one here. In this case, a blue and a yellow. If we see, you know, the overlapping between the different positions, we do the uh, lax war there. We, we do the war there, so we generate some re re result. If we do not have the corresponding mask to be sent to the device, of poor sound uh, structure, in this case, you know, the internal, we're going to preserve, you know, the original mask component, you know, and send them back to the original edge device. So that's actually be much simpler aggregation, you know, compared with you know the averaging of the gradients, right? So we um, profile the different types of the devices using the real devices in our lab, and we do the simulation, you know, on the environment, uh, in, in the uh, year experiments for the different data the data side by comparing the different baseline. I'm not going to all the de details. But the, 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 to raise the figure here, you know, the horizontal will be the accuracy and the, the vertical will be the communication time, which means the communication uh, cost. What we really want to do is to achieve the high accuracy as high as, as we could on this side with the lowest communication cost on this side, like we show here. It's a right star show the fat mass. This is a technology we propose. And any other method give you us you know, the bad trade-off between the accuracy and also the communication cost. But we'll talk about the memory footprint because that's what's our original motivation. If you look at the footprint, the federal mass gave us a smaller footprint compared with the baseline models. And we also compare the binary neural network, which you're pretty much familiar with, right? Which means we have a binary neural network with the same size. The binary neural network gave us an even much smaller footprint because they only have zero and one per weight, so per you know parameter of the neural network. But binary neural network does not really give you good accuracy, so it's uh, basically not be the fair comparison. So the, in terms of the uh, inference speed up and also the energy saving, you start to see the drop between the baseline and the fed mask. And binary, yeah, they have a much smaller number, but again, it's not be you know um, reasonably uh, reasonable performance going to be achieved. So 
Okay, so take away, you know, for today's talk. So the deployment of AI technology on edge computing involves many innovations across the layers in algorithm, power, and system design. So this has become so complicated. So when you are designing the algorithm, you really need to know how those algorithms are running on the hardware. When you are designing the hardware, you really know which algorithms you are designing for, right? So it's already past the stage, you can bluntly do something, hopefully that can work, you know, by using the firmware or something first. So efficiency and trustworthiness, you know, which is not covered by this talk. I can talk, I give an, another one one hour talk about this, but the two um two ma major concerns in the mo mo modern AI powered edge computing platform. Um, and they're correlated. I just show one example, how you can come basically combine the pruning and the quantization together, but there are many other ways you can understand, you know, the similar technology. And the designed AI models must consider the input from all the aspects, you know, as well as the data to be processed. There's be another large um, dimension about the data processing, which also gave you a lot of insight about how designing, you are designing the algorithms and also how we're, which will not you know, cover here, but that's also important. Okay, I think I'm finished. I, I, I finished my talk and open for any questions you may have. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Hmm, I think you can, can design some policy. Yeah, so saying you have some guidance, how you're gonna pick and how you can, what trade off you're gonna make. Yeah, usually you don't really manually pick those stuff, yeah. yeah uh, sure. So, the thing is not here, it's interesting, um, what are the privacy implications? Because uh, assuming that you, <laughs> Send a certain person like yeah. Yep. And, and the second question, why are we calling lottery tickets? There are different sort of We call what? A lottery ticket. Okay. Those are very good questions. So, first one about the privacy of the federal learning. So, there is a trade-off, okay? So it's not like you have some perfect solution which can preserve the privacy without sacrificing something else. Always the trade trade-off. So fortunately, there are many papers, even myself, you know, have some people talk about the differential op optimization, which you can have a one branch give you the highest representation of the features you want to recognize, but also give you another indicator about the privacy you are going to lick. So when you're doing the optimization, you're basically trying to optimize the both scales like the min max scan, right? So you can maximize another one, you know, minimize the, the, the one. So no matter you're gonna use a lottery ticket using the binary so on the first, you can always, you know, even not you, you can always you placely generate, you know, the or you value the impact on the privacy leakage and find out a way to do the trade-off. Let's be the one, uh, one answer on this. Talk about the second one, which means a lottery ticket, because people are gonna question about how you generate this uh, subset of the neural network, right? Because you need to somehow find out the training process to, to do it. Originally, you can certainly do randomized optimization, but later on, you can really train the neural network by finding out the best representation on this. So it's also relevant to the neural architecture search design because traditionally when we're doing the neural architecture search, we only consider the, topo the impact of the topology on the accuracy. But that's not true, right? If I look at you know, the neural network, how you're gonna train the value is going to also play a very important role which was not considered. You'll need to somehow find out the encoding scheme to really optimize them together. So lottery ticket does not consider this, only consider the topological impact, yeah. Yes. 
Mm -hmm. So can be louder, I think people, yeah. Okay. So Is that selection of that part of the network done by the central part or by the downstream model? By the downstream model, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're scaling on the space that they're going to one, but you also have to start with regular. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a very good point, right? Because you only, um, but during the, during, the, during the transfer, you depends on how you encode the skin, right? So you can transfer, I have a transfer this position because in, as, a central, as a, a central server, you have uh, the whole network. Okay, so when you're sending the data out, you have the topological information, you know which one you're sending, which one is not. By matching this information and uh, the complete neural network, you know which one you are missing. So that won't really give you additional overhead. That's right, but on another side, you don't really update them because it's it's not going to. No, okay. When you are sending the lottery ticket or the mask, so on the first, you know, you basically send them a part of this and whole neural network. And when you do the aggregation, you only aggregate, you know, the one you receive, you know, with overlapping, right, and then send them back. Yeah, if it's if you're not going to sending me to me, I'm not going to send them back back to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You need to. It really depends on how you send. You know, for example. Um, you you can send their locations a lay, lay, layer because you think about how you're going to present the weight. You have this uh, number of the layer, number of the kernel that's on the first, right? Then, when, then you have the value. When you send everything out, they do the one to one matching. They know which one you are not sending to me. I don't need to send the information, just missing from the matching part. So you know, you, you know what you're missing. You don't need to send this. Uh, this location information with a zero, you don't send this out. You just completely ignore it. Yeah, sure. Hi, Dr. Chen, sure, could you hear sure, me? Yeah. Dr. Chen, I had a quick question about like the first part of your talk. Uh, where you had mentioned that we can use neural architecture oh, search to yeah. to uh, uh, in, like optimize the hardware architecture. So I was wondering, uh, is that prerequisite uh, that we know the training data set beforehand or the task being performed beforehand, or does it not depend on that? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, the stops, yeah. Good question. Actually, people talk about this for a long time, especially we start with the pruning and the quantization. How are we gonna do the pruning and quantization simultaneously? And then talk about the NAS. You have a NAS, then you do the pruning, but NAS itself is about pruning, right? So there, there was some paper about this, but I don't think you know people have done good job. They still pretty much you not know, separate. When do the not they do not? After they got something, they start to worry about the quantization and the pruning. So I don't really see anyone can really try to con try to combine them together. There's so many parameters they need to optimize. I don't really know that we're gonna end up with you know the better solution. Yeah. 
yeah. Yeah, they all correlate and impact each other. Yeah. Um, no, uh, so far I don't see any good work you know, on that direction. But it's a very good and also important question. But unfortunately, it's so complex so that I don't know there's any solution yet. Uh, you're right. On another side, the reason people did not use code design before is not because they they never thought about it. It's maybe because number one, they don't have a, the resources that we have now, especially computing resources to really consider them holistically. Another reason maybe because they try out and they found out it's no better than optimize them separately. So I don't think people never thought about this. I just think people don't feel at that time this give you additional benefits yet. Yeah. Yes, uh, you have to. So really is the uh, optimization of the hardware or the software purely based on what kind of application you're target targeting. So the better you know, the data side you're going to perform, the better chance you will optimize the algorithm and hardware. So we actually talked about this yesterday, uh, or actually today with the pan panels about this. So um, there is a missing link in the current neuromorphic or in general, the AI hardware design, which is um, even people talk about interoperability of the AI models when the people give us the hardware designer, you know, the AI models, we don't try to understand what, what do they mean. We basically try to partition the model to the operators, which we can understand in hardware and try to map them, right? It's not right. Because when we start losing those information in the hardware design, what we really do is nothing different from, you know, the simple high-level synthesis. But when we were designing the scientific computing system and also DSP in the past, we actually exactly know this DSP operator mean what? This uh, data flow will actually be you know, the decoded and it will be reused and it will be accessed and we design the whole pipeline. But we don't have source information when we're designing the AI hardware. We need to somehow to have those interoperability in the AI computing hardware to really give us a more insight about where we are designing at a higher level, not just the tools that we'll map them down to the array of uh, multipliers, array of, uh, you know, so, so symbolic, uh, so systolic array, that maybe a two lower level, that's, uh, that's not just gonna give us much information, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. let, let me give you one example. 
A couple of years ago, when we were re-examining our AI curriculum, we found out our current AI curriculum were, were too theoretical. When we teach their AI models, we say we do the optimization, we do, you know, the derive them bound, you know, the convergence and so on. For who care about this, right? If you go to the company, as long as you are designing the neural network running to solve the problem, you're done. Even for the training, we teach people say, you need to sacrifice the loss function, blah, blah, blah. I told my student, you know, do you really think, you know, that will be the case? So if you go to a company, give you a sufficient company resource, you train uh, the monsters to convert to the loss function? No. They only give you 24 hours for 100 GPU, whatever you get it, done. You know, after 24 hours, they shut down all the, all the computer, they will, you will be wiped out, you know, you get what you got. So there is a gap between our current education and also the what the company really wants. So starting a couple of years ago, we launched a new course called the Computer Engineering Machine Learning. That gives people basic knowledge about neural networks on first, and give them the ideas about for the different neural network, why people came up with the different designs, topologies, what's, what were the insights for them the rest, uh, rest night, why people came up with this residue or stuff. So they understand this. So, and then we give them some example to try out, you know, to solve the problem, but we don't give them say, you need to understand optimization, derive the bound, who care about this, right? So we're designing the course for the student who has no CS background, but still want to use the machine learning to solve the engineering problem. But that turns out became so popular course that later on the computer science and math people that really want to, you know, enroll that course because they feel like this course will be very helpful for them for job hunting and for the interview. So that become one of the most popular course on the campus. Every year have 100 students. 100 students is a large ideal because we have a very small number of the you know, undergrad and also another 100 on the waiting list every semester. So this is one example to show how we find out the missing link between the education. And I told my student, if you choose this course, you need to learn the basic computer architecture. Even your thought, you only need to do the, use Python to programming. But that's not true. You need to learn the architecture. You need to learn why this, this computer is going to run like this. So I think people know this. If you really show the student the importance and also the needs and how that can help them for the career and the research, you know, they will buy it. But the issue is how we can sell this concept to them. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Let's put it in this way. So one day the deep neural network will be gone. Okay, let's put in even no matter how hard it can be, a large language models on the first 10 years, 20 years, we'll find out some more interesting technology to replace it. But the operating system, you know, this, uh, this, those things, you know, compilers, they'll be there forever. Okay, so yeah, yeah.